low, a very poor showing, they're immediately blaming it on Trump. So the reality is that the Obama economy throughout his presidency was abysmal. The only thing that grew were the size of the speculative banks and some venture capital operations, mergers. But the economy as a whole, the manufacturing base continued to shrink in fact, it's been shrinking for 16 years, going back to Bush and Obama. We've lost over 5 million manufacturing jobs since 2001. And what we're seeing is a, an explosive buildup of corporate debt and mortgage debt, also auto debt. I, I don't know if you've been following this, but the, the auto sector is starting to lose business because of the uh, inability of people to pay back car loans. So what we see is a debt bubble that is going to explode. Now, what Trump is trying to do is, is deal with it on several levels. One is on trade, and I think he should be commended for pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, talking about NAFTA, although they're trying to scare him back into sticking with NAFTA. Uh, secondly, for me, most of this talk about tax cuts uh, it's a lot of nonsense. It's not going to work. But what is interesting is the discussion of Trump and others of Glass-Steagall dealing with the banking situation in a way that would open the door to writing down some of the bad debt. Now, if you don't do those things, you're not going to have an economic recovery. Now, the other thing, of course, is the potential the United States would have were it to join with China on this explosive growth operation called the Belt and Road Initiative, or the New Silk Road, uh, where they just had a major conference in, in Beijing, uh, the United States is orienting toward that. Uh, our group has been saying that, that Trump should participate in this personally. Uh, he didn't. I mean, he's obviously got a lot of fires to put out. But he sent someone from the National Security Council, and the U.S. is very much involved now in talking with the Chinese and others about U.S. companies getting involved in these major infrastructure projects. So the potential is there for Trump to do something on this. But I think the, the, the potential rests in a break with the old system. And this is why there's an attack on Trump, because there are people for whom the old system is a cash cow. The, the zero interest money from the Federal Reserve that feeds into speculative casino operations and so on. So I, I think we're seeing a huge war that the American people are being denied a picture of it because all, all we're getting is the story of the so-called Russia corruption angle. So my view on the economy is that it's a real weak point. Uh, I, I see it here in Europe. There's no solution that anybody has. The euro is is still dead in the water. The Banking situation in Southern Europe is a catastrophe. And the idea that somehow there's a recovery is one of the frauds that was associated with Obama. And I, I think if Trump is smart, he would, instead of trying to, to take credit for a few jobs here and there, make the point that he's still dealing with the 16-year collapse with the bankers and others with Bush and Obama. What's very interesting about all of this is that the the deep state, I mean, they wanted TPP, they wanted the TTIP, and they didn't get that. They want NAFTA. They don't want him to renegotiate NAFTA. Actually, they don't want him to get rid of NAFTA. And what he's doing right now, and this is what I'm seeing, is that he's undoing what they tried, what they were doing all in the past. And we have to remember the deep state, they're intertwined into the government. They, they're so, and this is why they're the deep state, they're so deep into the government that it's very difficult to do anything right now. And they're nervous and afraid that, you know, he's going to unravel and take all of this apart. I see the One Belt, the Silk Road, where this is actually going to be beneficial to a lot of the emerging markets, um, to Europe. Uh, there's going to be free trade, and I think it's going to be a, a huge benefit. And I think during Obama, well, the United States didn't even want to get involved with that. And now with Trump, he's maneuvering to get involved with this because I think he understands that we need to be a part of it. Obama was completely opposed to it. 
uh, as yes. evidenced by his effort to sabotage the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, to use the South China Sea as an issue to turn the countries of, of South Asia against China, to turn the Japanese against China. All that's failed. All of that's changed. And it's not just that Trump is open to it. It's that there's a dynamic that's going on that has momentum that has very little to do with the United States. It's a Eurasian-centered development process where the Chinese have done a number of things well, uh, in particular, investing the surplus money they have, not in speculation and mergers and things of that sort, quick buck speculation, but in long-term investments. Now, this threatens the whole system. And you mentioned the deep state. The deep state is not only intertwined with the government, but with the financial markets, the financial yes, networks. Yes, that is true, too. You know, the CIA originally came out of Wall Street. So you have these people who think, who arrogantly think they're born to rule and that no one else has a right to interfere with them. And they use what... I guess you would have to call it geopolitical processes of splitting the world between East and West and North and South and regional wars, regime change wars, uh, anything to avoid some breakout of the system. Now, the system is collapsing and countries want to get out of it. The Greeks want to get out of it. They were very active in Beijing at this conference. The Italians the Italian prime minister, Gentiloni, was there and came back with deals for upgrading ports in the Adriatic. Uh, you, you see the, the unwillingness of countries like the Philippines to be told what to do by the likes of Obama. Now, Trump has come in and he's basically said, we want to hear what you have to say and let's open the door and make some deals. And it's a kind of free trade, but it's different. It's not the globalized free trade of the corporate cartels. It's the idea that we, that we live in a globalized world, but the globalization has to be for the benefit of other countries as well, which is not what the old British Empire or the Anglo-American Empire wants. So you have a conflict between these two systems, and Trump, for whatever reason, had a vision of breaking with this old geopolitical system. And the center of it was around the relations with Russia. And so it's not surprising that this is what the enemy has seized upon to try to destroy Trump. And as you and I were talking before, with all the many months, and remember, this goes back to June 2015, when the GCHQ, the, the British, started tracking Trump, since June 2015, they've been trying to find evidence of his corruption tied to Russian firms, to oligarchs tied to Putin, and so on. With all the capabilities of the NSA and, and the cyber warfare capabilities and so on, they don't have a single thing in nearly two years. So what's the point to this? Well, the point is they're doing everything they can to sabotage Trump to keep him from doing what he wants to do by turning the, the whole political environment into a 24 hour, seven day a week uh, discussion of who's corrupt and who knew what when. And in a sense, they're going by the old Watergate playbook. And, and what I find very interesting is that they hired a uh, special counsel to investigate the Russian involvement in the elections, the Russian involvement with with uh, Trump. And this was all based on what happened with the New York Times and this memo from Comey, where no one has seen the memo. I mean, it was read over the phone, and there's no proof of anything. But they went off of that, and I think it was Rosenstein who decided to, okay, to calm the situation down, I guess, let's get a special counsel to look into something that we have no evidence about whatsoever, which to me, when you look at other different things happening, like the Obama spying, you know that there was a criminal act with someone unmasking the Clinton emails. I mean, there's so many different things that there's nothing for that. When you talk about the Watergate playbook, what was the key thing? 
Nixon went down not because a bunch of CIA guys and deep state guys uh, planted a bug in the DNC headquarters. And actually, it's so interesting, the parallels, DNC in 1972, DNC in 2016, yeah. the involvement of the CIA, the FBI, and so on. Nixon went down because of the so-called cover-up. So what are they saying now? The firing of Comey shows that Trump fired him because he wouldn't cover up the Russian connection. Well, prove there's a Russian connection. If you can't prove that, there is no cover-up. There was an attempt to counter a lying media story that is omnipresent. You can't escape it. And the constant drip, drip, drip of slander will now be increased by the existence of a special counsel, uh, more leaks, uh, un unnamed or anonymous officials saying that they happen to know that Trump once had dinner at a Russian restaurant owned by an oligarch who's a third cousin of Putin's maid. You know, th this kind of stuff is absurd. But it's all designed to stop the emergence of this new strategic reality. And I think this is what, what people have to be focused on is rather than get into the minutia of who did what when, look at where we could be going. Look at what they're trying to stop. We're talking about a multi-trillion dollar, 10 to 20 year investment plan that the Chinese have now recruited other countries to be involved in with them. I think there were 68 countries that were represented in Beijing. And what we're talking about is global connections on uh, maritime silk roads, water, uh, high-speed rail, even collaboration in space. And this is the most exciting potential. And this is how you can kickstart the, the moribund U.S. economy. And instead, what are we getting? The same old fights, the, the budget debt ceiling fight, the tax cut fight. Uh, they're trying to contain everything within a system which is failing. And we've got to break out of that. And, and I think that was why Trump got elected. People were sick of that old system. I think the U.S., and I, I think Trump realizes this also, that we need to be involved in that trade system because the system that we're in now, like you said, it, it's completely failing. It's, it's not going to work. And we definitely have to change things up because if we don't change things up, we're kind of doomed here. I mean, I, I don't think the deep state... Uh, I don't think they'll ever give up. I, I think what they're going to do to the very end is most likely crash the economy and they will stop him at every turn. If they can't get him out of office, they'll make sure that the United States doesn't join up with uh, China. He doesn't, you know, get rid of NAFTA. He doesn't do all the things that he wants to have peace with North Korea, stop the wars in the Middle East. They don't want him to do any of these things. And I think what they'll do is they'll completely distract him with a collapse of the economy and he'll be too busy trying to clean up stuff here. And here's the problem you face with the economy. The debt bubbles are approaching a hyperbolic point where something is going to have to give. Now, in 2008, there was a certain amount of room for bailouts, but the Federal Reserve has basically used up that room. In fact, they've bought virtually every worthless piece of paper they could find to pump money into the banks, not into the productive system, but into the banks to protect the face value of worthless assets. Now, all that's left for them under Dodd-Frank and the EU, the European Union has a similar thing, is bail-in. But even if they steal all the pension funds, all the, the uh, uh, money that's in deposits and saving accounts, it can't possibly cover the total volume of debt. So this is an explosion that's going to happen. Now, there are several approaches to this that have worked. What they did in Iceland, where they basically said, we're not going to recognize some of these debts. Uh, in fact, they put some bankers in prison. What the Chinese did with the people who tried to create a consumer debt bubble is they jailed bankers. I think they may have even shot a couple of bankers. 
I don't recommend that, but you know, it's one way of dealing with this problem. And they're letting the air out of the hot air out of the bubble. In the US, we're continuing to stoke the bubble. And at the same time now, you have all this talk about the economy's in such good shape, now we can start raising interest rates. But the International Monetary Fund did a report that said if interest rates get above 3% in the United States, which could happen fairly quickly, 20% of American businesses will go into bankruptcy. So we're looking at a catastrophic situation. Now, that's why when Trump started talking about Glass-Steagall, we saw a flurry of articles, all of which said, number one, it won't happen. Well, if it won't happen, why are you writing about it? Number two, it would be disruptive. That's the whole point. We want to disrupt the speculative system. And number three, what they said is that there's no evidence that the repeal of Glass-Steagall had anything to do with 2008. And that's just plain bunk. The interconnection of banks and hedge funds and shadow banking was all of one parcel, which included the whole mortgage-backed security fraud. So if we go back to a regulatory process that forces these too-big-to-fail banks to choose, are they going to be commercial banks with protection or investment banks with no protection, they're going to have to deal with this debt problem. And basically, they're going to have to write down the debt. And that is the way you have to do it, a controlled, orderly reorganization. But what you're saying, Dave, I absolutely agree with. The deep state would prefer to go to a disorderly, chaotic bankruptcy, which they could then use to protect their own interests and if necessary, go to a higher level of police state to control the opposition. When you were talking about like writing down the debt and, and removing parts of the debt, I, I think we have to go a step further. I, I think we need to look at the central bank because if we just write down the debt and we continue on with the central bank, we're back in the same position. No, you're absolutely right. You got to get rid of the Federal Reserve in some form. The, it serves no purpose except to protect the speculators. And this has always been the, the purpose of this was not to run government finances, but to allow private banks to run the government. And so I think this is a, a long overdue process because as you're, you're saying, you're, you're right. If you don't do that, if you don't do something about the Fed, then that's going to be the mechanism used to maintain control after a collapse. I wanted to ask you a question since we're talking about debt and the debt getting very uh, large. Um, there was a couple of articles out there saying that the IMF throughout Europe was looking to impose a 10% tax on people's wealth. Have you heard anything about that? There are a number of stories of that sort floating around Europe. The other thing <clears throat> that's just been uh, brought up after Macron's victory in France is the idea of establishing a central European, a, a unified European budget. That is, get rid of the sovereign state capabilities to have a budget and have all the money flow to Brussels and all the expenditures come out of Brussels, which would then allow for the to facilitate a tax of this sort, a 10% tax or some kind of additional value-added tax on, on every transaction that would provide the money for this. Now, this isn't going to work uh, because the European countries are in so many different levels of development and so many different degrees of indebtedness and, and worthlessness. Uh, what do you do if you have a central government in Brussels having to deal with the Greek crisis, the Italian crisis, the Spanish crisis, without just taxing the Germans, which is pretty much what they're doing anyway, but they want to formalize it. So I, I think it's a non-starter, but you know, you could hear the sigh of relief when Le Pen lost in France. Uh, and I think what that showed is the cowardly corruption of all the so-called opposition parties that folded and, and went behind this guy, Macron, who to me is sort of like the Obama of France. Obama basically came out and phoned him and gave him his blessing. 
Well, he also <laughs> sent over some political operatives to help him. So here in the United States, with everything going on right now, I mean, we still have a problem with the budget here in the United States because the trillion dollars only lasts until September 30th. We still have the debt ceiling problem and nothing has been solved at all. So once September 30th hits, what happens at that point? Well, my view, and I know this is Mr. LaRouche's view, is that we have to do something before September 30th to change the system. Because if all you're doing is is allowing the government to function crisis to crisis, you don't have a solution. You kick the can down the road. You come up with uh, a threat of a shutdown, or you even do a shutdown for a little while, but you don't solve anything that way. We need real reform. And this is what we were talking about. You have to the, what Mr. LaRouche has proposed is, number one, Glass-Steagall to shut down the speculation and to force the investment banks to eat their bad debt. Then secondly, a national credit system, similar to what the Chinese are doing, which was based on what we did in the United States under Alexander Hamilton, that enabled us to pay off a debt which proportionally was about the size of the current $20 trillion U.S. debt. What Hamilton did is he extended new credit. He used the debt as the basis of extending new credit through a bank of the United States, which was not run by private bankers. Uh, and it wasn't just run by the government. It had a, a kind of a mix to it. But what they then did is made sure there was credit available for major projects and in infrastructure, roads, canals, port development, and then for manufacturing for entrepreneurs. That's how we got out of our debt crisis at our nation's founding. So a, a Hamiltonian credit system and then credit going specifically to infrastructure, but at the front ends, including things like nuclear fusion development, a space program. We saw what NASA did to the U.S. economy in the 60s. So these are some of the ideas that, that would transform things. Now, if all you're going to do is come up with some posture of either shutting down government or not shutting down the government with a compromise, you're not going to accomplish anything. And it's going to add to the insecurity and instability. And also, I think it will add to the irrelevancy of the United States and the world because other countries are not going to wait around for the United States. Now, to get to that point, I mean, to, to get to where, you, you know, you were saying we want to we want to go. We can't have, like we said, the central bank. We can't have this debt. We can't have the system the way it is. I, I think the only way out of this, and it's not going to be good for many individuals, but is to default on almost everything and actually restart everything to get us back up and running. Almost like what Trump does with his businesses where, OK, we I have too much debt in the business. The, the the business isn't operational. I need to basically wipe out the debt. I need to default and go forward from that point. I, I think that's the only way forward right now. Well, there are areas where bankruptcy reorganization would work. The problem is you can't really do that with the government. But that's the genius of what Hamilton did. Hamilton figured out how to use the debt as a means of creating new credit. And this is, let me give you an example of what the Chinese are doing compared to what the, the West is doing. Okay. The debt in the West in, was used by, or the, the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve purchased a lot of these bad debts. The, the ECB is now buying junk bonds to inject liquidity. But where does the liquidity go? It goes to the bankrupt banks. Now, what Hamilton said is let's take these bonds that otherwise seem to be worthless and turn them into a credit system. And so one of the things the Chinese are doing is they're using their holdings of U.S. treasuries because they know the treasuries, at least up to now, uh, are not in danger of default. They're using the treasuries as seed capital for uh, creating credit, much in the same way that the Germans in the 1950s used the money from the Marshall Plan to generate credit for the economic miracle. So my thinking on this is that you look at $20 trillion and you look at the, the level of growth of debt and say, well, this is exponential, it's, it can't continue. 
Well, it can't. But how do you deal with it? Some of it you do have to write off or write down. Uh, and you let the speculators take the losses. But you can't do that with, with uh, families and small businesses. You have to give them an opportunity to have a reorganization. And that means you need to have new credit from somewhere. The problem with just letting everything crash, a kind of Schumpeter uh, creative destruction view, is that you can't really be sure where the destruction will stop. And there are too many lives at risk in something like that. But I think you could do it in an orderly fashion and let the regional banks and the community banks determine which companies are viable and should get new credit. That's the way we did it in the past. You don't need a government bureaucrat sitting over an agency in Washington to figure it out. You have local bankers that, that know how to do these things. But the local banks can't get the credit now because it all goes to the New York banks and the money center banks. So do you think this is Trump's approach and what, what you're explaining here? I mean, I know it's not the central bank's approach. Well, I, I think this is what they fear is his approach. The fact that Trump has twice now met with community bankers associations and pledged relief from Dodd-Frank. Now, most people don't understand that because they think of Dodd-Frank as Elizabeth Warren and consumer protection. The key thing in Dodd-Frank is it enabled the big banks to grow without changing anything. In fact, worsening their uh, portfolio, the, the so-called Volcker rule and these things don't really function. So when Trump says he's going to get rid of regulations, what he means with Dodd-Frank is that he's going to take away the onerous uh, regulation on small banks that makes them incapable of competing with the large banks because they don't have teams of lawyers and accountants. Take that away and then free them up for investment in infrastructure and community projects and, and local developments and, and uh, uh, providing credit for entrepreneurs. I think he does understand that side of things, and I think that's why he's intrigued by the idea of Glass-Steagall. The problem is you've got a couple of probably foul balls in there from Goldman Sachs who will screw this thing up. So ultimately, it's going to depend on whether Trump keeps his promise that he's going to break with this system, or is he going to try to uh, conform to it in some way. So far, what I see him on the strategic level, he's fighting it. He's continuing to fight. You know, this meeting he had with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov was a real poke in the eye to the establishment. Yes, I mean, it was. It, it's hilarious when Lavrov shows up with Kisilek, the uh, Russian ambassador, Trump joked to Lavrov, ah, I see you brought my boss, the guy who got me elected. <laughs> and the media couldn't believe it. Uh, but I think, and then Putin coming out saying, you know, how stupid do they think we are that, that I must be the most powerful man in the world if I can convince Americans who to vote for. So most of the world looks at the United States somewhat bewildered. Now in Germany, because we have a similar problem here in Germany with Merkel, Merkel is sort of a cross between Obama and Hillary, uh, you know, the, the Germans have the same media coverage that you have in the United States. But much of the rest of the world is looking at the United States saying, what the hell's going on? You're going to throw a guy out of office because he met with the Russians? Because his advisors talked to the Russians? How crazy is that? And, of course, when Trump tweeted that, he said, wouldn't you think it's a good thing if Putin and I were able to talk? Well, the media said No. <laughs> Right. That, they, they don't want him to talk. They don't want peace. They don't want discussion. They don't, and they that's don't. what we know from the post-war period, especially the last 30 years where we've been in one war after another. You know, from the every single day Obama was president, the United States was in war. We were bombing countries. We were droning people. We were creating new terrorists. We were arming terrorists every single day. And Trump comes in and says, we're not going to do that anymore. And I was very heartened by Tillerson's comment that we have our values, but those values are not our policies. And so what is, what's the media coverage? Oh, now we're going to sidle up to dictators. So 
you know, the, the, you have to ignore the media and recognize they're nothing but uh, agents of influence of the city of London Wall Street crowd who are enemies of the United States. Bannon is right on this. That's the enemy. Now, the question is, can the American people figure out what's right and what's good? And I think it's hard to know exactly where Trump is going to go on the economy. But I think his impulse to orient toward China and orient toward Russia on strategic matters and to kind of thumb his nose at the European Union is a pretty good start. I think you're absolutely right about that. I think he's moving towards the one belt, one road, uh, Silk Road system, because as we know, he met President Xi Jinping in mar largo and I, I do believe he met him down there because he wanted to speak to him because there's a lot of leaks coming out of Washington. Probably the offices are bugged, you know, in every single room. Single Maybe the room. chocolate cake was bugged. Maybe. And I think he wanted some privacy because I think they're also working with um, not just China, but, you know, with Russia. I think they're working with North Korea, with the Philippines, um, the rest of the Asian um, islands and countries around that area to all get in on this deal. Even though the deep state is trying to push the war with North Korea like there's no tomorrow. I mean, that's their whole agenda. I think he's looking to calm the situation down, work out a deal economically, and have everyone cooperate. And this is why, and I, I call it deep state speak, you never hear him talk about red lines or absolutes. Um, those individuals that speak, you know, you're either with us or you're against us, like Nikki Haley, she said, you know, you're either with the United States or you're with North Korea. She gave an absolute. She totally is with the deep state, in my opinion. Trump just says, I would meet with Kim Jong-un. Yes, he might be a bad man, but I would still meet with him. And it looks like he's working with South Korea right now to maybe have a meeting with him to calm the entire situation down. Well, the solution in the Korean Peninsula is obvious. The Silk Road. You have a rail line going from South Korea through North Korea. You bring the North Koreans in on it. And, you know, to, to get there, you're going to have to do some diplomacy, some negotiations, but it's going to have to be with countries that the North Koreans at least think are not out to destroy them. And I think Tillerson's comments that we're not going to do regime change, uh, Trump saying that he wants Xi Jinping to be involved in this, uh, and, and one other thing, don't overlook the importance of Japan right now. President Abe, or Prime Minister Abe, was uh, uh, represented by his top diplomat at the Beijing conference. Abe is going to be meeting with Putin for the third time in, in the last six months. Uh, he had a good friendship develop with Trump. Uh, the Japanese are talking about investing 15 to $20 billion in U.S. infrastructure, and Abe joked, we need a high-speed train that connects the White House with uh, Trump Towers in New York. So there are some real uh, potentials here that Americans just don't know about. Because when Xi Jinping was here, what did we hear about? Syrian chemical weapons, another false flag lie that was used to try to scuttle the potential of a U.S.-Russian relationship. So I, I've been writing a series of articles on these things. Um, if, if your listeners would, would like to get a copy of one of the articles I've been writing, uh, they can just send me an email and I'll be happy to send it out because you're not going to get this uh, information in your mainstream media. So if people would like to see the kind of work that I'm doing and on behalf of LaRouche Pack, just send me an email to harleysch at gmail.com. That's Harley sch at gmail and i'll be happy to send you a, a, an article and you can take a look at what's really going on in the world so harley where do you think we're going from here what do you think is going to happen well the, my advice to a few people i know around trump is he's got to be more direct in what he says and you can't just do it with twitter he's got to have a press conference where he says look this russian stuff is nonsense it's coming from people who are trying to destroy what I'm trying to do, which is to break out of the old geopolitical game, which means war and depression, 
into a new era of peace and economic development. And anyone, and this is one case where he could say, if you're using the Russian slander against me, then you want to continue these wars. You want to continue to build up the terrorist states against us and against our people. I think he's got to be that direct and even name the names. Look, we know, for example, that Comey had the number two man at the FBI, this guy McCabe, was working with Terry McAuliffe, the governor, the Clinton East, the governor of Virginia, to try and elect McCabe's wife to the Virginia State Senate. Yep. Terry McAuliffe gave McCabe's wife $750,000 from his PAC to run for a state Senate office in Virginia. So what do you have when you look at Comey and, and this network? You've got coup plotters. You've got conspirators. Comey was working from the beginning with Clapper and Brennan. I'd like to see Comey's notes from his meetings with Brennan on the investigation of Trump. You want to see some notes, New York Times? Why don't you subpoena those notes from Comey? Maybe Grassley will ask some of those questions when Comey before, comes before the Senate Intelligence Committee. But Comey's a highly conflicted guy. And what, what I fear is they're going to use this special counsel, as you said earlier, to have a drip, drip, drip attack on Trump until the American people just get so weary of it, they just say, forget it, let's get rid of him and move to another page, which means the deep state will have won. So I hope Trump sticks to what he said at the Coast Guard uh, ceremony the other day, fight, 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 never give up. But he's got to be more explicit in identifying the enemy. And on this Comey question, he should ask some questions, either himself or through surrogates, of Comey's connection with Clapper and Brennan in doing this original uh, Putin did it, Russian meddling story. Secondly, did the FBI offer $50,000 to Christopher Steele or not? That's a story that's come out in the, the London Guardian and also is in the Washington Post. Why is the FBI trying to hire an ex-MI6 operative? And we know there's no such thing as ex-MI6 operative, right. but one who originally was working for the Bush campaign and then the Clinton campaign. Isn't that a conflict of interest? Isn't that meddling in an election? So I think there are some real questions that Trump could ask. And, and I think we have to demand that the, the, those people who are serious about defending this country stand up and defend it now. 